Awful Sports presents Awful Autopsy, Cleveland Big Cat Williams. Tonight's episode, Big Cats Out of the Bag. On June 1933, in one of the worst years of the Depression, the future big cat Cleveland Williams was born in Griffin, Georgia. Griffin is part of the Hotlanta metropolitan area. His childhood until the age of 14 was relatively uneventful. At 12, in the seventh grade, he dropped out of school to work in a paper mill. Though not the norm in the South, this was not unheard of. He had a fake ID made at 14 and boxed until he was caught. After winning about four fights, and then the commissioner caught him. William's lack of stealth caused him to wait until he was 18. By this time, his mom and aunt had already headed to the tropical treasure known as Tampa, Florida. Cat's mom's health was ailing, so he got on a greyhound and moved to Tampa. After arriving, he contacted Lou Viscusi from a Tampa bus station. Viscusi was best known as Willie Pep's manager. Pep is considered one of the greatest pound-for-pound of all time. Lou would go on to manage one of the greatest light heavyweights of ever, which was Bob Foster. Lou sent Cat to Yaba City for refinement to Tony Kinsella's gym. Kinsella was a former sparring partner of Max Bear. Tony sadly died in 59 at the age of 50. Williams was on the cusp of his journey as the Alexander the Great of 1950's Cracker Barrel Circuit. With Cancella as his Aristotle, Cat began crushing tomato cans on the Southeast Circuit, mostly in Miami Beach to New Orleans. In the 11th day of December in the year 1951, the Cat started a war on Palookas, crushing his first tomato can appropriately named Lee Hunt. With a third round KO, and of course that was in Tampa, Florida. Catnip in the form of easy matches was what Williams was weaned on in those first 21 months at the age of 18. Williams shredded them all with fanciful names like Baby Boos, Graveyard Walters. Williams also twice iced a fellow by the name of Ponce de Leon Taylor. Big Cat was 27 and 0 with 23 knockouts. His future was gold approaching the top of the heavyweight mountain. What could go wrong? Feared and ducked by the top 10, Williams was approaching the top 10. The underground scholars point out that only one man, Emilio Agramante, who once fought Joe Lewis, had any name recognition at all. However, it's only appropriate that another cat, Sylvester Jones, handed Williams his first loss in the four-rounder in September 1953 in the old New York Polo Grounds. Sylvester Jones scratched and clawed his way to a shocking four-round decision. Williams did not pass go to the title, but back to the drawing board to dine on more tomato cans, until the right opportunity presented itself. Bob Willis, Claude Roll, Jimmy Walls. Three tomato cans later, all were stopped, setting the stage for Big Cat, Little Cat 2. Williams would later avenge his loss by knockout in the following year in their sequel catfight by KO in the seventh round. Viscusi was now in charge of running the shows in Houston, redirecting Williams to continue his title quest. 
After running his record up to 31 and 1, his handlers thought a name in the middle of the pack, a puncher to challenge Williams, was in order. Bob Satterfield, a kamikaze-like puncher, was chosen. This would mean a title shot for Cat. The match was set June 22, 1954. Bob Satterfield went for broke and pummeled the big cat, and in the third round finishing him off with a left hook that kept Williams' lights out for over a minute, just a couple days short of his 21st birthday. The next couple of years would bring a career change and a meat cleaver. Williams was crushed. He was the crushed can this time and left boxing to join the army. The big cat in the military matched as well as a cat to water. Cat could not acclimate to military life. He tried for all he was worth, but it was something he could not do. The cat was mostly AWOL or in the brig in his army days. Williams was AWOL so many times that he was considered a deserter. During one of his AWOL stints, Williams tried to fight as Eugene Mack against Johnny Hollins south of the Cat Stomping Grounds in Austin, Texas. Williams won the fight by a third round KO in August 6, 1956, about a year before his stint was up. Williams lost, however, at being a stealthy ninja as Johnny Hollins already was knocked out by Williams before he pretended to be Mack back in October 1952. Hollins or his camp is believed to have reported Williams. Cleveland was arrested and sent back to the army where he finished out his time. Big Cat was once again a civilian and fighting again as a civilian on June 11, 1957, the Big Cat resumed his quest for the coveted NBA championship the widely regarded supreme boxing governing body of that time. Big Cat's quest continued. First on the plate was Johnny Mason in Cat's hometown ring in Houston, Texas. This was Cat's first effort in the fistic world after his failed military service tour. The Cat won in a big way via first round KO. Two other wins, both early wins over Marshall and Clifford Gray, and both were vanquished via KO. Viscusi, his manager, decided that the Cats de Tour in the military service meant they must try to make a run at the title before Williams crashes and burns outside the ring. They could not afford another Stray Cat episode by Williams. Not, not those stray cats. Yes, much better. Anyway, uh, this meant stronger opposition, mixed with a few palookas as their map to get to the title belt. Two wins over game fighters. One round KO over Johnny Holman, and a hard-fought decision over Frankie Daniels, followed by a tomato can named Gene White. Then a step up in jolly old England, over Dick Richardson. Richardson, who was trying to use his head, albeit illegally, with repeated headbutts, bringing home a disqualification win in the fourth round for Cleveland Williams. With people still ducking him, Cat fought Daniels again in another close decision, and also a second fight set up with Dick Richardson. In this bizarre non-fight with Richardson, Williams, a God-fearing man, refused to fight and wouldn't leave his hotel room because God told him not to fight. Richardson offered to fight him even in the room if need be, but Williams believed God and claimed that God told him so. So the fight never occurred, but God would revisit Williams in a big way. After two wins over decent opposition, one being Howie Turner and Ollie Wilson being the other, is a golden opportunity 
but not anyone's first choice. Williams was without question ducked by a lot of fighters, including Patterson and Igema Johansson. Both were locked into a trilogy at this time for the next three years. However, Aliston was even more feared than Cleveland Big Cat Williams. Big Cat took on Sonny, who was 23 and 1 at the time, with only 13 by KO. This was deceiving because Liston wasn't managed very well and fought and beat a lot of people before he should have been fighting them. Liston, in his next 27 fights, would win only one by decision and KO the other 26. Also, Liston's head was so hard that it was said by guards and police that they would break their nightsticks over them with little effect on Liston. Back to the fight. Big Cat came out swarming and bombing Liston to the head and body. Williams eventually bloodied Liston's nose in the first round. Liston got in a few licks, but Cleveland was by far the more busier and landed more and harder punches. Round two, Big Cat continued the onslaught, settling in more on his punches with vicious shots to the body that was loud enough to be heard beyond ringside. Williams again bloodied Liston's nose. Liston's blood put Big Cat into a frenzy as he pummeled Liston more between the head and the body. But then Liston counted and threw some bombs of his own. Williams likewise bombed back as the second round unfolded with both fighters holding their own. Liston amazingly appears to be unaffected by Williams' punches as the third round approaches. Round three with Big Cat bombing again, but Liston is bombing back. He's saying it's my turn now as Liston pummels him with rights and a couple of lefts to the body, another big right, another, another right, and another, oh, down goes Williams. He goes down to the canvas, slithering down the ropes as the referee counts on. Big Cat gets up, a little bit groggy. The referee lets him continue. Williams comes out st still trying to run as Liston is chasing him down into the corner. There appears to be no escape as Liston pummels him once again with big rights, and down he goes, flat on his back. Referee is counting over Williams. It appears that Williams is not going to get up, but he, he does make, he beats the count, out on his feet, but the ref again, you know, the ref has decided not to let him continue, and the match is over. For Williams, a third round lost at 2.04 of the third round. Vescuzzi thought it was a tough loss, but something to build on. The quest for the highly coveted NBA title belt, the supreme boxing authority of its day, was not to be forgotten. An ASAP rematch was now more important than ever. Vescuzzi thought Cat was able to land heavy on Sonny, and Liston could be taken if they got him soon. Williams had nothing to be ashamed of. He hit Liston with punches that would have knocked down brick walls and bloodied his nose in two of those three rounds that they fought. Liston was Captain Scarlet like seemingly indestructible. Those rumors of police breaking nightsticks over Liston's head seemed to be verified. They needed a tune-up and chose a game fighter named Harold Carter, a Golden Glove champion. Carter was 27 and 4 and 2. He had a draw and a KO against Cat's old nemesis, Bob Satterfield. Carter had a good record and would be challenging, but alas, Carter would injure his arm and a challenging replacement was sought on short notice. So Ernie Cab, a tough fighter, was chosen. Cab fought gallantly against Sonny Liston about a year earlier and would be considered a tough test for Cleveland Williams. On May 26, 1959, in the Houston Coliseum, challenging Cleveland Williams with 43 wins, 3 defeats, and 36 KO. Versus Ernie Cab at 13 wins, 
10 losses, 1 draw, and 9 KOs. Cat was pummeling Cab at will, and by the second round, Ernie was bleeding heavily from facial cuts, as Cat was connecting hard and often. This continued until the sixth round, with Cab fighting back gamely in round seven. However, Cat roared back in the eighth round, and with a left hook, ended in a knockout and a countout at 105 of the eighth round. Cab retired after this fight because of the beating he took. However, Cab needed to eat, so he came back after about six months, but he wasn't the same and lost six out of his last eight before retiring for real after losing in October of 1962. The fight, televised nationally, chummed the waters in boxing fandom for the Big Cat Liston sequel. A match with Liston was signed, with Liston being the number three heavyweight at that time. The place for the much-awaited rematch was in Houston, in the Coliseum, for October 14, 1959. Management's plan seemed to be going swimmingly. What could go wrong? A meat cleaver was the answer. Big Cat, 26, and his girlfriend Gwendolyn Scott, age 20, on July 20th had an argument which Miss Scott tried to prove her point using a meat cleaver. To hit Big Cat, he then grabbed the cleaver and knocked Miss Scott down to the ground, where she then went to the hospital with head and back wounds. Miss Scott refused to press charges, but the police took the meat cleaver. Williams, seven days later, while training for the williams Liston 2 fight, jogged into the police office, asked for the cleaver back. When asked by the police why would he want it, Williams said it was a borrowed meat cleaver, and the woman who provided the cleaver wanted it back, and he had to return it now. Strangely, the police complied, and the big cat jogged back home with the meat cleaver. Getting the meat cleaver back, however, caused the incident to get out to the mainstream. Luckily for Williams, it was 1959, and the cancel culture wasn't invented yet in the United States. Williams was in the catbird seat, no pun intended. Then in October, about a week before the fight, Liston injured his hand training, and Curly Lee, no, not that Curly, yes, much, much better. October 10th, 1959. In a nationally televised fight with about 14,000 in the Houston Coliseum, Curly Lee had a record of 18 and 1 with 14 knockouts. Curly Lee, up and comer, was the last stop in the rematch with Liston. Lee had a lot less experience and was outweighed by 30 pounds. Big Cat came out with both barrels blazing. Williams staggered Lee, not that Lee, yes, much better. Lee was staggered in the second round and pounded in the third, but Lee did get Cat's eye to swell in the third and caused Williams' nose to bleed in parts of the contest. In the fifth round, Williams knocked Lee down twice. Lee somehow still was upright and was staggered in the sixth as well. After a fairly even seventh round, Lee had won both the eighth and the ninth rounds, making the bout close. Lee always hit back strongly between the pummelings when the cat stopped to load up in between beatings. It did appear at times Williams did not follow up when he should have, which kept Lee with a puncher's chance. Was it mercy or fatigue only Williams knew? Finally, in the tenth round, a vicious left uppercut, looking like a Hiroshima bomb, that pretty nearly lifted Lee off his feet and onto his cranium and out cold for a couple of minutes. After being revived, the ref had to attend to Lee before Lee got to his feet. It was a brutal match and a tenth round knockout for Williams.